interesting subject, or at least a different subject. Uh, you might want to pay attention though, because everything I'm going to tell you here today is really cutting. <laughs> and uh, it's interesting. Mr. Martin wanted me to give this before break. I said, no, wait until after break. I'll be rested. That way I can give a razor sharp presentation. And uh, it'll just work better for all of us. So here we go. Guillotine. I, I pose a question that I, I kind of want to throw out to you guys before I give you my response. Why is it, about all methods of execution, uh, are we so fascinated with this one, the guillotine? And, and I think I can support that fascination angle from uh, literature. Uh, if you think in terms of a tale of two cities, the guillotine is always sort of lurking in the background. It, it, it's a major part, I think, of what pulls us into this novel, you know, we are worried about people. Uh, hey, be careful, or you're going to end up before the machine. But what do you think this one, more than other men? What are you thinking? Okay. Okay. Any, anything else coming on? If you think about yourself, who you are. You don't really think, if someone presented your big toe to you, right? You don't instantly recognize it. Well, that's me, right? Uh, but if someone were to present your head to you somehow, instantly you know. It's our center of cognition, right? It's what we recognize as ourselves. We don't think of this appendage or that as ourselves, but right here. And I think it, it carries a particularly strong psychological power over us to think about this machine. Tell me later if you agree with me or not. I thought a good place to start would be to put this in perspective. We're going to talk about the guillotine, how it came into being, why it came into being. We already talked about what executions were about prior to the guillotine. I would say probably hanging uh, from the Middle Ages forward was probably the most common method of execution. But you have to also think about this. Hanging is not, you watch these old westerns, you know, and you know, you've seen the hangman's knot, and they open the trap door and snap, the neck is broken and it's all over. That was not the method of hanging that would be utilized uh, right up until the 18th century. Uh, basically, it could take 15 or 20 minutes for you just to hang it before you would be fully unconscious and asphyxiated. It was a very long, drawn out process, therefore very gruesome. Add to that, the, especially the English method of hanging and quartering. Can you tell me what that involved, Morgan? You know they have the court cases? Yeah. And, and usually, if they didn't uh, want to go to that extreme, we're going to usually hang you for a while, making sure you're still conscious. And yeah, then, then they would cut off various parts of your body, uh, often cutting open your stomach and making you look at your entrails and so forth. And that can be really well documented. You have all of these English executions of hanging in court. Shakespeare's wives, relatives, one of her uncles, actually executed uh, by that method. He was accused of treason. Largely his crime was being kind of a pro-Catholic. And uh, reading that account, which comes down to it's pretty gruesome stuff. Uh, burnings, uh, you're familiar with that. Uh, fairly common. Uh, again, right up into the 18th century. Uh, I don't think we have to go into any great detail to uh, explain how horrible a death that would have been. Uh, I put my own little slant on this one to pull apart. Uh, this is a method where uh, I find particularly gruesome where they would actually take uh, animals, usually horses, and their arms and legs would be connected to maybe one of four horses, and they would just simply hit the horses and off you go, literally. And surprisingly, people could 
could survive that for a while. Uh, so it's not an instant method of death. Uh, all of this is a way of, uh, uh, again, laying some background as to why the guillotine uh, is, is so significant, its introduction. Then, of course, beheadings were with nothing new. Uh, that was a fairly common method of execution. Mir remember Mary, Queen of Scots? Uh, Elizabeth was convinced by her advisors that she had to go, and of course she was brought to the scaffold and beheaded. But there was a difference between the way the nobility was executed and commoners. As a commoner, you would be executed with an axe. Usually, I suppose, is the common old garden variety axe. Uh, if you were a noble, then you got, like Mary Queen Scott, you would be privileged to be executed by a sword. What's the difference? An axe is dollar. Yes. Axe is usually going to take, even with a skilled executioner, might take two, maybe even three times to do the job. A really skilled swordsman, Morgan, you're right, could do it usually very rapidly. Rarely more than than one. Uh, so that was uh, part of the, goes into the history of the guillotine too. There, there's no equality there. Hey, you're just an everyday variety peasant, so so what if it takes three or four times to, to do the job? No equality there. I'm talking about the public aspect. That's one thing that I think uh, Dickens makes great uh, markup in his novel, uh, Public Executions. Think about Madame de Fars, right? <laughs> Sitting there knitting and all. That's really not that far-fetched. People came to executions. This would have been a form of entertainment. Uh, there were two principal reasons, I think, that executions were made public. One, it was supposed to be a moral lesson for us, right? If you see these executions, it's a not so subtle reminder, this is what happens to you if you break the law. Or if you uh, behave in treasonous ways, this is what happens to people. That's the moral guy. That's what the governments would often say. That's the ostensible reason for having an execution. But I think the second reason is even more persuasive and probably the real reason they continued to be public. It was great spectacle. It was great entertainment. I know you've talked about in Elizabeth and the England, you know, say you go back to Shakespeare's Globe, you've got the bear baiting, right? People would show up to uh, see these bears fight it out with dogs or some other animal. Very gruesome stuff. It's sort of in the DNA, if you will, of people that, of this time period. Uh, so showing up to see a hanging, and more, by the way, we can we have the words of people who attended these things. The more gruesome, the better. Uh, it's entertainment. After all, this is a criminal. They deserve their fate. Even children were allowed to go to these executions. So when Dickens has people showing up at the guillotine, uh, this this people uh, turned out by thousands often to witness these spectacles. Interesting side note to this. When Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to put this on Ronald Reagan. I'm just saying there's an era where a lot of talk in that era about uh, let's clean up America, let's, let's uh, bring back the death penalty. Uh, and there was a real movement in the country during those years, not by Mr. Reagan, but by uh, people who, ultra conservatives who wanted to really make a point that we ought to go back to public execution. The idea if we could see someone uh, meeting their faith on our television screens, this would be a real warning to the rest of us not to, not to go there. And, and I remember that at the time thinking, wow, that, that's really right out of the old world. That's an old world concept that somehow this is going to make us better. Yeah, it might be uh, fortunate that we can get, get that far. But you'd be surprised. Go back and look at some of the state laws that were proposed during the era. There were people who were very serious about that. 
there were machines prior to the guillotine that are crudely uh, kind of forerunners to the machine we're going to focus on. But uh, everything I could find about this, they were largely just taking an, an axe and suspending it by a rope or some other device and required people to cut the rope and then it was supposed to descend from a height and uh, there you would have uh, uh, the execution. Uh, the problems with these early machines is they were just simply not <laughs> very effective. Uh, they were not quick. They usually required more than uh, two droppings, which could be time. Imagine having to wait around to be partially cut, having to wait around for the machine to be re reorganized or put back together. So didn't get very far with it. But here we come to our main topic, talking about community. It's named, as you know, I'm quite sure from your studies, after an actual uh, figure by the name of Dr. Guillotine. Uh, please notice that uh, he spelled his name without the E. So this Dr. Guillotine, who was a medical doctor, and he serves in the legislative assembly. Those of you who remember your French uh, Revolution recall that series of legislative bodies that were brought into existence. He's in this legislative assembly, and in 1789, he's going to make a couple of proposals. Actually, he made something like six, but we reduce it to the two things <coughs> here. One, he says, I think the country, France, would be better served if we could uh, produce a machine, a machine that could produce a execution. Why do you want to do this? It relates to the central control. He thought the execution should be private. They should be more humane. See, he's looking back at this history that we're looking at. He knows what executions were like. There's probably no doubt that he had attended several of them over the years. Why should people be brought to agony, he said? And, and why should it be a public spectacle? He thought that was an abuse of power. He thought it was kind of productive. And he's sitting in this legislative assembly making these proposals. Well, the second point wasn't accepted. Obviously, we're still going to have public execution. But the idea of a humane method of execution really caught on. But maybe not for the very reasons you might think. I think the people in the legislative assembly were attacked into this idea of a machine. Not so much because it could reduce suffering, but if everybody who's accused of a crime, capital crime, and convicted goes to the machine, what's the point? Of, what's the political point? It's equal. It's, equal. it's an egalitarian point of view. It doesn't matter. Oh, Jay Bird over here is an aristocrat. He will get the same treatment that Emily, the young peasant girl, gets. Just. But that, that really carried the day. That's what really persuaded the legislative assembly that we ought to do this. And of course, you have to construct something better than currently existed. So they really went about the business of, of sort of advertising who could produce a machine that could do the job, that could, could really be uh, as efficient as guillotine wanted it to be. And this caught on, but it took several years for that machine to be produced. As far as I can tell, it looks like the machine that, as we know it today, uh, really was first used in 1792. So we're at the height of the French Revolution. Uh, things are uh, beginning to really heat up. France is at war with Austria and then Prussia. Eventually, of course, England will come into the situation. Uh, lots of things are happening. Uh, more and more people are, are being accused of uh, capital crimes. And in April of 25, 1792, we first had this machine used. Uh, do you know who Henry or Henri Sanson was? He was the great executioner. I cannot remember, Mr. Martin, that uh, he has made reference to in 
tell it to City. I know his name gets presented in a lot of other novels. Because he's the primary execution. He's the guy who would operate the machine in Paris. And uh, therefore, his name would be associated with thousands of executions. Interesting thing, the French decided that the chief execution of that position would be hereditary position. So eventually, he'll pass this on down to his sons. How would you like that? What should dad do for the living? Oh, he's an executioner. Someday that's what I want to do. That's what I struck to do. But he actually had a pretty good reputation. You may want to guess why he would have a good reputation? He did the cleanest. Yes, exactly. He kept the blade sharp. He uh, had a reputation for treating uh, the executed party humanely with courtesy. And, but mostly, James, you say, with efficiency. So he's really a character. I suspect that you will see his name and have some recognition of him in future uh, novels, uh, even today in French society. Most people know who Samson was. Uh, passed on in their history books. Anybody uh, notice that E was added? to guillotine thing. If you go back to the original spelling, it was af directly after his name. But they added the E, and it seems to be for no other reason than when you speak it in French, it rhymes better with other words. So uh, guillotine is mentioned over and over in poetry <laughs> and uh, songs, and there the E just made it smooth, and that's how we spell today. But if you leave off the E, just tell your teacher, hey, I'm going back to the original school, right? I'm, I'm right, you're wrong. Um, but the egalitarian aspect, I would really uh, stress that. And there's some truth to that. It really was uh, equalizing the, uh, the way in which you could be executed. I have a question. We always raise studying the French Revolution. More of the third estate or of the first two estates? In other words, more upper level people or middle, lower class people executed? What do you think? Who, got, who, who was brought to the guillotine more during the revolution? That would make sense, right? It's against all the king, it's against all this, the nobility, <coughs> reshaping, but in effect, uh, about 75% of the people who are executed during the revolution are from the lower classes. Well, there's reasons for that. There's just more of them, right? Uh, and in fact, a lot of the nobility, some of them at least, had enough sense to get out of the country. So uh, what was meant to be egalitarian uh, really is applied more directly to the third estate. Terror. Always talk about that. Again, uh, go back to a tale of two cities, the terror. Uh, those who know the French Revolution, that very word sort of stirs us up. We know what the connotations are. Uh, in 93, the new legislative body, which is now being called the National Convention, they promote a new idea of treason. Uh, that idea was something like this. If Jake was overheard talking to Andrea and saying something bad about the, the revolution, about the war. That could be a capital offense under this new definition. If you fail, Lauren failed to stand up when the Marseillaise, the French national anthem, was being performed. That could be a treasonous offense. In other words, it really broadens the definition so that everybody could be a suspect. It, it, it spread great fear, this terror. You know Robespierre, Danton, Morat, the three key members of the Committee of Public Safety, their list of people to be brought to the guillotine. Crimes, seeking out who is to be brought to bear. Uh, it's the same year in January, so it set this off, it was the execution of Louis XVI. So thousands of people are going to be brought to this machine between 1793 and late 94. 
how many, we, we can't say for sure because records are very inaccurate. Uh, we can only make guesstimates. And I think maybe the best guess, guesstimate I've seen, that's just from taking various texts and references, maybe as many as 20,000 20, people actually went before the guillotine. And keep in mind that this doesn't mean other means of execution were totally done away with. And they would do things like take people out in the middle of the lake and scuttle the boat. Uh, firing squad uh, was another method. So it's not just the guillotine, but the guillotine, of course, takes center stage efficiency. I would say no, because it's not particularly more efficient than other means. I mean, you can find all sorts of ways to execute people. Uh, that you might even argue that the, the firing squad might be in a simpler way. Uh, so I don't think so. I think it just gets attached to this because when we think of the terror, we think of the French Revolution, this machine, as I said earlier, just sort of looms out there and won't go away. But I don't think it's specifically made of terror. I think that's more of the psychology of this revolution. And I guess the other question, was it really? Uh, was it really more humane? Based on just what we're talking about, what do you guys think? Would this have been a better way to go compared to some of these other things? Yeah. Compared to the old style hanging thing? Yeah. 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 Compared to being pulled apart? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. I'll take it. <laughs> so much better. Yeah. I, I don't want to lose it. Because we believe that you went pretty quickly. There's all sorts of weird experiments during the French Revolution and later about do people keep their consciousness. Uh, one experiment one doctor did was he made free range with a, a criminal. This is after the revolution. Uh, that, okay, if you understand what I'm saying, you'll blink once for you know, uh, two for a different response, et cetera. Or one for yes, I should say, two for a different response. And he claims that for about 20 seconds he was able to get a response from, from the head. That has no scientific basis. Uh, we can only speculate, but we can assume it's pretty quick, cutting off the oxygen supply, all of that. Would be. And I would, I'd much rather face the guillotine, as gruesome as it is, uh, it would have been more efficient. There were exceptions, though. Sanson himself had one remarkable failure. And that was the execution of Louis XVI. Uh, they did not sharpen the brain pro properly. He was rather corpulent all those years of uh, eating and doing not a whole lot else. He was hunting on the side. His neck was so thick that it took two times to execute Louis XVI. And go back and read the accounts of Louis' uh, blood curdling scream after the first attempt. So it wasn't always as efficient, but it, the job was done properly. Post-revolution, the Nazis, they understood the psychology of this machine. You know, as terrible as they were, one thing that Hitler and his group understood, how to get into the mind. And uh, they knew that this would be an instrument of terror that they could uh, really influence people by the prospect of Chad, if you're going to go to the, the guillotine, that can kind of keep you in line. And, and Hitler used this particularly on political enemies, people who were accused of treason during the Third Reich. They used it. The French made their last public execution in 1939. No more spectacles with the guillotine. And then their last use of the guillotine was in 1977. That always surprised me when I see that date. I, I think of this as a medieval, uh, you know, old school, uh, 18th century at best innovation, but they used it right up until 77. There was a room that Dr. Guillotine himself was a victim of a terror, but not true. He lived, died of natural causes, a fairly old age, in 1814, so he lived right up almost to the end of the Napoleonic so, yeah. Do what you can to avoid that thing. All right?
Thank you.